All right, welcome everyone coming in. We're gonna take a few minutes to let people get settled. This is a webinar format, so you won't be able to see yourself. You should see Lisa, possibly me or Tom um, in a little box. And then on the screen, you should have this great square foot raised garden bed. If you have any trouble, um, you can let me know in the chat and I can try to help you. We'll give it a few minutes for people to get in before we get started tonight. If you're not familiar with Zoom, you're gonna have some things on the bottom that you can use for tools. There's a chat and then there's a Q and A. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end and you can use those tools for that. We'll give everyone a few minutes here to get going. It's just seven o'clock now. We'll be getting started soon. Welcome everybody that's logging in right now. We're excited about the program tonight and raised bed gardening. I'm especially excited here at the Kimberly Library. We have some raised garden beds, so I'm excited to learn more about how I can use them. Old minute yet. Okay, so we have a lot to go through, so I'm going to get it started. Welcome everybody to Master Gardener Presents, um, our May edition. Um, I am here with Tom, who is the mastermind behind this program, and he does all the planning. I am Jill from the Kimberly Library. You probably know me. I'm also a master gardener with the Outagamie County Master Gardener Association. Um, and I, I'll send it over to Tom to tell us about tonight's topic. Well, prior to that, we have our garden walk coming up on June 25th, mm -hmm. and it's going to be three public gardens and this year is going to be free. So you can take a look at uh, what gardens are available at uh, the ocmga.net. That is our website and the gardens are uh, the Shig, which is a Memorial Park, the um, Master Gardener, gardens at the extension and wild ones. So uh, with that said, I think I'm just going to turn it over to Lisa and uh, we'll go from there. Hey, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jill, for inviting me tonight. Uh, hopefully everybody's able to hear me okay. Uh, Jill and Tom, am I coming through all right? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, great. We'll hope that that's the case for everybody. <laughs> uh, tonight's talk is kind of a mashup of two different talks. I was asked to talk about raised bed gardening, but also about accessible gardening. And there is some crossover between the two topics. Uh, so I will uh, go ahead and uh, start that. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm the Dane County Extension Horticulture Educator, and I uh, oversee the Master Gardener Program in Dane County. And if you happen to be in the area, a uh, little shameless propaganda here, I would like to invite you to come see our teaching garden here at the office. You can actually do a virtual tour. Uh, if you just put in your browser, your internet browser, uh, Dane County Extension Teaching Garden, and when the page comes up, there's a tab for the teaching garden. So you can click on that 
and see all the 12 different garden areas and uh, plant list. So, okay, done with the propaganda, moving on. So this is kind of an overview of the talk. You can see there's quite a lot of stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to be talking kind of fast in order to uh, cover everything. So uh, we'll start out by talking about square foot uh, gardens and then move into other types of raised beds. Uh, we'll talk about all things growing stuff in raised beds. So that would include the planting media, waterings, crop spacing, mulching, et cetera and a um, little bit about um, succession and uh, fall planting. Um, not going to talk about that too much, um, but we'll talk um, a little tiny bit also about container gardening. That actually is going to mostly be in um, the accessible gardens part of the talk. And then I'll finish up with some resources, and then we'll start the other talk. So here we go. All right, so square foot gardening is the brainchild of a guy named uh, Mel Bartholomew, and it's been around for quite a number of years, long enough that he's got a second edition of his book. And the idea with it was that this was an intensive cropping system uh, for people to be able to produce more food in smaller areas than if you were having a traditional row-based in-ground garden. And it's called square foot because it's based on a four by four bed with one foot square grids. And the claim is that they can produce uh, five times as much as a, a row garden, uh, the same size as that, um, which uh, makes a certain amount of sense, but uh, is, is quite a subjective uh, measure. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, just to... Um, kind of give you an orientation to the square foot gardening. They now have a foundation that's a 501c3, and uh, they also teach classes and um, donate gardens to a lot of different organizations. So you can learn more about that at their website if you're interested in that. Okay, as I mentioned, the square foot gardening model is to use frames that aren't any wider than four feet and using a four by four arrangement. However, uh, when we move into talking more about other kinds of raised beds, you can kind of um, apply this model to a rectangle as well. So even though square foot was designed for a square, you can put a one by one grid on rectangles just as well. Um, the original square foot garden said that board should be about six to 10 inches wide so that your, um, your depth of your planting media is at least six and ideally 10 or more inches deep. Uh, personally, I think that if you're going to plant tomatoes that you need a bed that's actually deeper than uh, 10 inches because otherwise your tomato roots are going to be running into the in-ground soil. And um, because there's going to be quite a difference in texture, sometimes that can stunt the root system. So if you're going to grow tomatoes in a square foot system, I, I would advise that it should be at least 18 inches deep. And other deep rooted crops like uh, pepper should at least have uh, 12 inches deep. Now you can make your model out of any kind of uh, wood type product, or it doesn't even have to be a wood type product. It could be like we have in our teaching garden, we have Trex, which is a uh, product that is made from recycled plastic and wood and lasts a lot longer than actual wood. Um, so there are a lot of, again, different ways that you can put this together. And if you go online, you can certainly find a bunch of different models. Um, this one is kind of fancy where it has a rod going through and it has these uh, cutouts at the corners. Um, this one is a little bit uh, easier to put together where it has these uh, corner pieces uh, that are separate from the, um, the boards. 
uh, what we did in the teaching garden because we were operating on a shoestring was um, we put uh, cedar posts into the corners and we also had these be uh, taller than the bed because we wanted to be able to drape row cover over them if needed. But so you can use um, you can use corner pieces um, to get that into the corners. Usually decking screws work pretty well for this kind of thing. Um, or again, you can use one of these fancier models. There are even places like Gardener Supply that um, will sell pre-made uh, parts. And I'm sure that a lot of the big box stores uh, or other places you can find on the web also have different um, kits that you can put together if you prefer that. So here's um, one way that you can achieve that four by four grid. Um, what they did here was they just had these um, pieces of wood, although you can, you can use a lot of things to make your grid. You could use old Venetian blinds, you can use string like they did here. Um, and then you can use either like this one, you would have to figure out a way to take it off in the springtime if you wanna add more soil and till, well, not till the bed, but spade through the bed. Um, and whereas with the string, it's, it's easier to remove, but you, know, you can certainly put in a, a screw every other piece and then unscrew them again the next season. So lots of different ways you can do that. And once you have your grid down, then it becomes time to figure out what you're actually going to be planting in your grid. Um, so you can see here, there are a lot of, again, different ways to do this. Um, and again, depending on your crop, you might have a fairly short one or you might have a fairly tall one. Um, but the great thing about it is that no tilling is needed. Just get in there with a spade and do a little bit of spading around and add uh, some more soil every year. Another couple of examples of um, what this can look like. Okay, so we're gonna talk about planting in a few minutes uh, and crop selection, but I wanted to go quickly also into other kinds of raised beds before we did that. So uh, here again is the teaching garden back in 2005. It was May, but it felt like October. Uh, so we're all dressed up in our <laughs> winter jackets. Um, we didn't bother to kill the grass underneath here because we were going to be filling this with uh, soil. Um, and not just soil, but um, potting mix as well. You can see there are other um, types of materials that you can use to make raised beds too. It doesn't have to necessarily be wood products. I've seen cement blocks be used. Um, bricks, you um, would have to mortar them in place. So there is a little bit more work with that. But as I mentioned, we did use Trex uh, because I knew I wasn't gonna have the budget to replace uh, the wood very often. And uh, also if you use uh, wood, make sure that it hasn't been treated with copper arsenate. Um, that is uh, not good for raised beds. We also don't recommend using railroad ties either because most of those have been treated with creosote. And again, you can, um, I usually recommend if you're doing a rectangle, usually eight feet is a good one, um, good length to use. But if your pieces come in 10 foot lengths, well, go ahead and use that. Um, you, can, um, you can sometimes get the wood cut where you buy it, but not always. Um, you also, the thing that you want to think about is how far across the bed um, you're able to reach from either side. This was originally built to be a children's garden, so uh, we went about four feet. All right, so um, for either the square foot or a square foot grid adapted to a raised bed, one of the problems with square foot gardening is crop rotation. And since you've all taken master gardener training and learned about planting vegetables and growing vegetables, you know 
that crop rotation is super important in trying to prevent disease and insect buildup. So if you're growing just one family type of crops in a bed, it's a lot easier to do your rotation. But if you've got, um, you know, 10 different uh, plant families all in one bed, that makes it really difficult to rotate your crops. And especially because it is a very small bed, even if you did rotate from one square to another, that's not enough distance usually. And also if you get some kind of um, soil disease, uh, such as like club root or something like that, it will affect the whole bed and you may need to remove all of the uh, contents and disinfect the, the bed itself. And speaking of soil and soil diseases, um, Square Foot Gardening Foundation recommends what they call Mel's Mixed, which is a third compost, third peat moss, third um, coarse vermiculite. And they suggest um, a blended compost and no extra fertilizer. We either recommend Mel's Mix or you can use a bagged potting soil such as one, uh, I'm, I'm not recommending this brand over any others. It was just a convenient photo <laughs> of a um, similar type of product. And so you would take that potting soil, most of those are soilless mixes, and mix it in a two to one ratio with composted manure and or bagged topsoil. Um, so you might actually want to um, adjust that ratio so that your one is actually half manure and half topsoil if you um, prefer, but you could certainly just use one or the other as well. And often you do still need to use some uh, traditional fertilizers or organic fertilizers. The one thing you don't want to do, though, is get a bunch of uh, soil from your garden and throw that into your raised bed. The reason you don't want to do that is most of us have pretty heavy clay soils, at least in the lower half of the state, except for some areas, and it uh, tends to turn into a brick when it is put in a confined area like a raised bed. So it's a good thing to use uh, either Mel's mix or again the soilless mixes that are very fluffy, but you add some topsoil or add some composted manure to add other nutrients and to make it slightly less fluffy, but still easy to work. Now, some of the bag products will have slow release fertilizer, but if not, they tend to be low in nutrients. So that's why you add the composted manure or topsoil. And again, if you wish to add the other fertilizers, you may need to do that as well. The idea is that this should be very easy for you to work um, when you put it in the bed. I mentioned crop spacing. So square foot gardening, um, the uh, Square Foot Garden Foundation recommends putting the crops in a grid either in um, ones, like a single plant, or fours, or nines, or 16 plants per square foot. And the way that they figure out whether you are a one or a four is based on how large the plant is at maturity. So for example, if you have a large growing crop like cabbage or broccoli or pepper, and certainly um, tomatoes would fit in that, um, that category as well, and it's really difficult to keep a tomato in a one foot square uh, space. So again, um, they may not be particularly suited for this, but you can see there they have extra large plants, large plants, medium and small. So the smallest plants, you can fit 16 of them at a spacing of three inches in one of these square foot grids. And then you use these others. And again, I recommend that if you have larger crops like indeterminate tomatoes, tomatillos, vine crops, that those not be put in square foot gardens just because they're way too big for a square foot grid. And square foot gardening also gives you crop spacing recommendations um, in their book. 
But if you don't want to buy their book, you can find a very similar template uh, online. There's uh, an example of an online planner at uh, gardeners.com. You do have to, uh, once you get to the page, use the search term planner and then click on the word article and that will uh, take you to where you can um, put your own uh, grid together based on whatever it is that you want to plant. Here's another example of that. This website is sadly defunct now, but I really liked the artistic um, depiction of what that might look like. Okay, mentioned crop rotation, gonna go into it just a little bit more here. Um, again, really important gardening technique to prevent buildup of disease, especially soil-borne diseases like those that attack tomatoes, but not only tomatoes, but other plants. Um, and so that might be something like early blight or septoria leaf spot, something like that. But we also have insects like squash vine borer and squash bug, uh, as well as others that will build up if you put the same family of plant in the same soil for consecutive seasons. Um, and again, hard to deal with in a four by four bed. Um, another thing that you can do though, um, besides rotating plant families is to use resistant plant varieties. We do have a lovely little fact sheet on um, the uh, crop rotation. So here's a link to that. Um, and if you're not sure which crops are in which family, this is in the fact sheet as well, but here's a list of plant families and the crops they're in so that you don't end up trying to plant um, like beans and peas and, and um, or have them in the same bed year after year. So ideally with square foot, what you would do is you would plant a whole planting in that square foot of the same family. And then the next year you would rotate those crops to a different square foot bed or a different raised bed. And you do that for three years at least. Um, so between families, you'd have this three year um, rotation. And a lot of insects and diseases, if you don't have the same family in the same place for at least three or four years, um, it often will keep them from building up to unpleasant levels. Now, whether you're doing square foot gardening, raised bed gardening, any type of vegetable gardening, or uh, for that matter, a lot of uh, flower gardening, mulch is something that is a good thing to use. With, particularly with raised beds, they're gonna heat up in the spring faster, which is great but they also dry out in the summer a lot faster than in ground gardens. So that means more watering. And it also means that mulch is important to try and keep the roots cool. The, you know, the smaller your bed is, the faster it's going to heat up and lose water. So that mulch helps to keep the roots cool. Uh, and also, if it's an organic mulch, you can turn that in at the end of the season and um, help to increase or improve the soil structure. And keeping the beds cool can help with controlling tomato blossom end rot, et cetera. Uh, what do you use as mulch? Ideally, uh, clean straw or possibly marsh hay. You can use grass clippings, um, composted leaves, uh, you can also use newspapers that aren't the shiny color type um, or thin cardboard. But uh, if you use cardboard, you need to make sure that you cut a big hole in it so that there's enough water getting into the plants. And again, watering. Um, successful gardens need at least one inch of water a week either by rain or by hose. If rain doesn't show up, well, you are the waterer then. You wanna try and water in the morning so that everything dries out uh, in time um, for evening. And I know a lot of us work. Um, if you can't water in the morning, do it as soon as you get home so that it dries out by the time evening comes. Otherwise, if it's um, wet overnight, you tend to get more fungal diseases. 
Now here's a little twist on square foot gardening that I thought was kind of fun. We did this in the teaching garden. It's called a pizza garden. And you take um, a kid's swimming pool and you drill some holes in the bottom so you have decent drainage, uh, fill it up with um, the mix that you're going to use to grow the plants in and you put in um, these little wood pieces to be the slices of the pizza. And then you put in it things that you might want on your pizza, like maybe peppers or oregano or chives or something like that. And then um, we used to make like the, um, the English muffins, uh, you know, with some melted cheese and then uh, we'd have some tomato sauce and then you would um, put whatever you grew in your pizza garden on top of that. Some resources here real quickly for square foot um, gardening. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back just a second here. Um, no, I guess it is this one. Okay, so while I'm talking about square foot gardening, I did wanna talk a little bit about succession planting. And succession planting um, is, a technique that you can use for crops that either have a quick production time, like radishes and lettuce and spinach, um, because you can do multiple crops of those, or you can do fall planting of things that take a longer time to grow. And so things like that would include, um, you can do um, some of your brassicas, so like your, your broccoli and your cauliflower, um, your cabbage, um, well, probably not cabbage, but broccoli and cauliflower for sure, um, kale, et cetera. Um, those crops actually will do well in the fall. Uh, so you can put those in around the end of August for a fall crop. A lot of those also will take uh, some light frost and actually become sweeter, especially things like um, spinach. So that's uh, pretty much the story of um, succession planting. Um, there are some other crops I didn't um, mention in there like uh, carrots and peas as well. So you can do fall carrots, you can do spring carrots, you can do spring peas, you can do fall peas. And uh, so a lot of those early season crops, you can get a second one in uh, for the fall. You just need to make sure that you're putting it in towards the end of August when things are starting to um, cool down. You definitely don't want to start it in the middle of July when it's super hot. Okay, moving on. Um, garden accessibility. Okay, so um, a lot of the information that I have here comes from the South, um, Southeast Wisconsin Master Gardener Group. They have a really great um, piece on their um, website called Lifelong Gardening. And some of that comes from the Master Gardener uh, program, uh, some pieces that Mike Maddox and um, Amy Friedegg um, recorded about how to garden as we get older. I can certainly attest that my knees are not what they used to be and my back is not what it used to be either. Um, and part of that is because I worked in the horticulture industry for a number of years um, doing all kinds of things that I shouldn't have done with my back and my knees. Uh, so at this site, they not only have three videos on uh, gardening for life, but they also have this awesome seven page list of tools and books and um, other resources um, for lifelong gardening. And uh, it's, it also has a list for adapting tools uh, on a budget because you could certainly spend a whole lot of money getting <laughs> a lot of the tools that we're going to be talking about. And we want to make uh, sure that everybody has a chance to um, experience some of these things and 
uh, so there are some hacks for trying to uh, do this on a budget. Also, if you visit the Arthritis Foundation website and you just put into the search box um, gardening or um, lifelong gardening or something like that, either one, it'll bring up all kinds of resources that you can use um, for gardening uh, as we age. So what this part is gonna talk about is first of all, using your body correctly. And um, I wish I would have known some of those things before I learned uh, bad habits. Uh, and also adapting gardening to your body's abilities. So the things we're gonna talk about may not apply to your situation, or you may need to check with your physician before you uh, adopt those gardening, um, either tools or um, specific techniques. And then we'll go into a number of the adaptive tools that are out there. The uh, science of adaptive tools has really, as our population in the US has become um, or continued to grow in the aging end of the spectrum, uh, a lot more companies have uh, started up and uh, begun producing not only garden tools, but of course, all kinds of other things to help us um, as we age. Okay, so this is something that I should have done even when I was in my 20s um, before I started work in the morning. Because uh, God knows once I started work, I certainly, <laughs> you're running all day and you don't have uh, time to do it. But stretching, it, and it's so simple, stretching exercises before you start to garden, especially in the spring when we haven't uh, been using those muscles for gardening purposes all winter. And um, we tend to, because so much needs to be done in the spring, right? And it all needs to be done at the same time. And so we tend to go out in the garden and hurt ourselves <laughs> um, trying to get everything done. And so if you, you know, do stretches for your uh, rotating your hips, uh, shoulder rolls, um, do the stretching of your, for your wrists, um, stretch your calves out and uh, do some exercises for your back. Um, that will really help you before you get out into the garden. And again, remembering to pace yourself. That's, uh, it's tough. I know that. Um, I, I always joke that why did I even bother to put a bench in the garden since I never get to sit on it uh, and, and look at the garden. So I've, I've tried, um, Last year, I was getting ready for a garden tour and ended up um, doing some nasty things to the meniscus in my knee, which still bothers me. So this year, I'm going to remember to sit and I'm going to remember to um, do my stretches. Here's another thing, too. It's I know all of us tend to think, OK, um, I have this task to do and I'm going to finish it. Uh, all in one sitting. And our bodies are not necessarily meant to do that, especially as we get older. So um, you may want to actually alternate tasks. Uh, so if you're doing some um, planting of seeds and you're kneeling, alternate that with watering those seeds in standing up or uh, putting down mulch or, or doing something where you're not in the same position for a long time. And um, so this will help your muscles from getting um, fatigued. Another thing to think about is proper, um, proper use of your body. So um, the kneeling, they're talking about doing it the way that the woman is doing it here instead of on both knees, although that isn't always convenient. Uh, I, I know we can't always do it, but it is something if your knees start to get um, fatigued that you might want to try. And also bending over properly is uh, helpful. Um, lifting. I know we all get to hear about lifting. Um, so you want to keep your back as straight as possible. 
um, this person is in the act of, of lifting, but when she was um, kneel or when she was squatting down, you want to have your knees um, not um, too far or even with your toes. Um, so you don't want to extend your knees too far over the toes. And when you lift, you're trying to use your, um, your leg muscles uh, and your buttocks uh, to help you with that lift. And also getting close enough to that object so that you have a better balance, whatever it happens to be. And of course, if it's too heavy, and this is where I fall down as well, um, I don't like to ask for help any more than the next person. So yes, I try and lift things that are too heavy for me. And um, that uh, leads to problems later on. Here's where that garden bench comes in, right? <laughs> uh, do sit down, take breaks every once in a while. Um, make sure you're wearing sunscreen so that you're not ending up getting um, burned. That'll certainly slow you down if you're not, um, not taking care of, of your skin properly. And also keep hydrated. Um, sometimes you forget to, um, to drink water, but it's really important to uh, take breaks and do that. Now we'll talk a little bit about if you're not able to kneel or kneeling is, is hard for long periods of time. Um, there are different ways that you can garden from a seated position. And one of those is seated on a raised bed, which we'll go into in a minute. But another one that's um, a really economical thing to do is buy one of those five gallon buckets that has a sturdy lid on it. So you can um, not only sit on it, but you can carry your garden tools into the garden. Um, one thing that is a problem with the way this individual is, is working is that he's having to, to bend over. Ideally, you would have something that has a longer handle on it so that you're not having to um, bend quite so much. But this certainly look, it's a lot easier on your knees uh, than actually kneeling. So that's one thing that you can use. Another thing, if you wanna invest a little bit more money is um, a garden uh, tractor. Um, this one, I found a few of them on um, various websites for um, about 140, 150. Um, Etc. And these are useful on paths, they're useful on hard surfaces, but obviously you can't get out uh, into the middle of a bed in them with very well without uh, crushing things. But if you have your garden set up so that um, you are able to um, reach a good ways into it using a long handle tool, this can really be helpful especially if you have to um, do a lot of weeding. Um, I'm not recommending this particular model. I went and read a bunch of the reviews, but um, I thought it was an interesting concept. Um, and there are quite a number of um, benches out there that are similar to this. I don't know that they all fold up, but um, I thought the folding up was cool. There are some other ones that also have um, attachable tool bags, um, which is another kind of nice feature. But um, these that are built so that you can either kneel on them or use them as a bench um, are nice. But you, um, one thing that you have to be aware of is if this distance down here is not very wide. Um, this particular model, I read a bunch of reviews where people said you have to be careful not to tip over backwards. Um, and uh, also this model and a number of other ones said that the part in the middle here is plastic and would tend to, um, to break. So not just this model, but other ones that I saw. Um, I was reading people uh, doing their own hacks with these, like um, using a piece of wood in place of um, the uh, inner part there and uh, that that worked much better. Um, so 
not to pick on this particular model, but I did look at a number of them and uh, quite a few of them seem to have the same sorts of issues. On the other hand, there were also lots of positive reviews uh, of these um, types of benches. So um, I would uh, just, you know, read your reviews before investing. But the idea is, I think, very sound where you, you have um, a kneeling pad that allows you to kneel, uh, especially if you need to be on a hard surface. Um, and you don't want to be kneeling on pavers or uh, gravel or something like that. This can really work out nicely. Um, and then you need to have something that can help you get back up again as well. So um, I really like the, uh, the theory of these things. It just sounds like sometimes the execution isn't uh, quite as good as desired. Um, okay. A little bit also about plant selection. This can really help you with accessibility um, if you don't choose plants that need a lot of maintenance. So choosing uh, ground cover plants uh, that will spread and don't need a whole lot of weeding or care, that can certainly be helpful. Um, you don't want plants that need a whole lot of deadheading, uh, staking, spraying, um, you know, any of those sorts of things. And then again, if you use mulch uh, to help with the weed control, that can really ease your gardening path uh, as well. Also, don't choose plants that are really susceptible to disease and you're always needing to be in there picking off diseased leaves or that, or trying to open up the canopy so that you get better air circulation. In other words, try and pick plants that will give you as low maintenance uh, gardening as possible. And then the mulch will also help to reduce your watering needs. Or if you have a really hot, dry area, choose plants that are well adapted to that, like um, sedums and succulents and um, prairie plants. And I want to thank Jill for these uh, lovely pictures of these raised beds. You notice that these have um, nice wide edges so that you could uh, sit on those if need be. Probably not on this one because it's too high, but for that, but um, you certainly could on uh, some of these. And with raised beds, of course, we've been talking about different sizes. You can make them different heights. You can make it custom for whatever height is comfortable for you to sit on. And you can uh, add wider edges too if they're braced. And um, you can sometimes also put wider edges on ones if somebody is using a wheelchair so that they have a surface to work on. Um, and there are even, you can even make raised beds with um, a couple different levels uh, so that if you need a work surface and then you need something lower to do the planting, um, that can work out too. So lots of um, variety available. This one I thought was so cool. Um, those of you who have been gardening for a long time and uh, known Extension for a long time may have had the pleasure of meeting Shelley Ryan, um, who we all dearly miss, uh, who had a show on PBS Wisconsin called The Wisconsin Gardener. And um, I had the luck of uh, filming with her for um, a couple of episodes of that. But this one I thought was such a cool episode that she did. She interviewed a woman who had had a massive stroke, who had been a devoted gardener and uh, really wanted to be able to continue gardening. Um, her husband was a handy sort and um, had this idea where, again, you're using a kid's pool, but it, it needs to be a heavy duty one. And you still need to obviously make um, holes for drainage. Uh, but what they did was they put it on um, these two, um, two, and a, two and three quarters plywood rounds. So I think they're uh, on top of each other. And then they uh, built their bracing underneath and they have their four by fours, which I believe are um, 
probably sunk into the ground a little bit to hold it in. And then they used what she called a 12 inch Lazy Susan ball bearing. And I'm not sure there must be some kind of track underneath there. Um, I wasn't able to find a, uh, an actual plan to build one of these, but she said that it holds 500 pounds of soil and that she could rotate that using the Lazy Susan um, approach um, with just a thumb and forefinger. And I watched Shelly, um, and you should, I encourage you if you're interested in this to, uh, to watch that episode um, where Shelly was <laughs> giving it a whirl and it did rotate very easily. So that the gardener uh, didn't even have to move her wheelchair um, too far in order to be able to reach all parts of the bed. Okay, um, container gardening. This is just another take on raised bed gardening, right? It's just using containers instead of raised beds. You can do a lot with containers. And it's the same theory where you have less bending and easier digging in lighter soil. And there are so many options. Um, I tend to like to, um, I use my pots as garden accents. And I like to use a lot of the ceramic um, pots that are bright blue. And so that fits into my color scheme in my garden. However, I don't necessarily recommend ceramic pots because they are heavy in every fall as I haul the darn things back in and every spring as I haul the darn things back out. I say, why did I do this to myself? Of course, I love it once they're planted, but Boy, um, if you have trouble uh, moving heavy objects, <laughs> that might not be the best. You might want to use um, plastic pots. And you can often spray paint them, um, plastic pots, uh, a number of different colors. So you could uh, make it look like you've got expensive ceramic pots. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of different things that you can do. So here's um, a, an example of somebody whose whole garden is raised, um, raised containers. And they even have some uh, hanging on the walls here, hanging baskets. So that may be you know, a good way to continue gardening, but not having to deal with heavy clay soil or a lot of bending, depending on how high you make your containers. Um, there are lots of ways to raise those containers up off the ground, so lots of things you can do. And here are some recommendations, and um, Jill, I'll make sure that you also get a, um, a printed copy of this uh, talk so that people can print it off if they want. Uh, we have this nice list of what you can grow in different size pots. Um, I would say for the tomatoes, definitely go for the 10 gallon pot or at the very least a five gallon pot. Um, and if you are going to grow those bigger, taller plants, you need to figure out some way that the things are not gonna blow over. Um, so some people, if they're growing it on their deck, will either you know, tie it to the railing or block it in with bricks. Um, if you have it in ground, you can pound in uh, some rebar um, through the drainage hole so that the, the thing doesn't act like a sail midsummer and knock the tomato over. And again, those larger crops, don't short them on the amount of soil um, that you put them in. Um, also, when you're choosing what crops to plant in containers, make sure that you choose compact bush patio or dwarf varieties. You can find that information on seed packets. Um, you can also find it often on tags. Uh, so like bush cucumbers or um, bush beans, um, compact versions of tomatoes, patio tomatoes. Uh, so lots of different options for that as well. And if trellising, again, just like with the previous one, make sure that the trellis can support the plant and that the pot isn't gonna blow over. 
Okay, um, a couple of things related to watering. Uh, this was something that I had not seen before, but you can get these commercially. So if you have your traditional faucet, like I do, it, you have to not only grab it, which is a pinching motion that may be uh, difficult if you're developing arthritis, but you also have to torque your wrist um, in order to turn that on. So they have these devices that you can screw to a traditional um, faucet and it has a lever on it that slides back and forth and you can either push it with the palm of your hand or you can just uh, turn it using um, your fingers. And in this sort of a motion, circling motion instead of a wrist torquing motion. Expandable hoses. I, I love expandable hoses. Um, that's what I use at, uh, at my home. And we use a lot of them in the teaching garden as well. Although if we have to stretch a hose over the road, it's definitely still going to be the old standard rubber hose. Uh, but they have, they have a lot of um, advantages, lighter weight, certainly kink resistant. Uh, I'm sure all of us have sworn at our hoses, our old rubber hoses when they kink and shut off uh, and then we have to go unkink them, find the kink and then unkink them. Um, so these don't usually do this, but of course the trade-off is that they aren't as durable as standard hoses. Now I did find this interesting article at this bobvila.com site where they rated a bunch of different uh, types of hoses, so expandable hoses, so you might want to uh, take a look at that. Now if you have um, a um, if your water pressure is pretty high at your hose end, if it's higher than 50 pounds per square inch, this is often too much for those hoses. So you either don't turn it on that much or you get a uh, flow reducer. And also these hoses will not take uh, getting stepped on too much, especially if they're on like sharp gravel or something like that. You don't want to step on them very often. Uh, you also don't want to run over it with your wheelbarrow or um, anything like that, and that will extend the life. Certainly, you want to make sure that you store them inside over the winter, um, and uh, you might even want to put them in your basement as opposed to your garage if your garage um, is not heated. But you can often get, you know, two or maybe even three um, seasons out of those depending on how often they're, they're used. Now we get into some of the cool adaptive tools. So I always used to, when I used um, a trowel, and sometimes I still do, uh, this wrist motion um, where you're, um, you're kind of torquing your wrist. These adaptive tools have these fist grips so that you're moving back and forth or um, up and, and down instead of the wrist torque motion. And so it uses push pull uh, instead of bending your wrists. When I worked for a landscaping company, they were always telling me to, to hold the, uh, the trowel by the handle and then stab it down like, like a knife and pull it towards you um, in order not to uh, torque your wrist. Here's um, another example of that. You not only have the um, fist grip here, but you also have an um, arm cuff to help um, keep your forearm um, from bending too much. This is just one that I, an example that I found out there on the internet. There are certainly many other brands. Here's a um, example where, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, if you have carpal tunnel, you, you wear some kind of um, wrist support. This one is a little bit more um, heavy duty than that and certainly can help you with the gardening. And you see this woman is using that technique that I just talked about where you stab the trowel in and you pull it towards you. Tool grips. Um, often we find that the tool is not the right size for our hands, particularly I think for us women that have smaller hands like mine, 
Um, I'm always having the opposite problem that this gentleman is having. Um, so you should be able to use your thumb and forefinger, and that's the ideal grip um, size for your hand. So if you find that the uh, tool is too narrow and you're having to overlap your fingers on your hand, then you can make that tool handle bigger. What they did here was some, uh, it's just some pipe insulation and that's very, um, very cheap to use. But there are also, I thought this was ingenious, you can buy these things and it's um, a plastic, uh, hard plastic that's inside this rubber um, shielding. So you slide that over the tool that you wanna make um, the grip a little bit bigger and it unravels and as it does, it uh, tightens onto the, the tool handle. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, a lot of us use wheelbarrows. Um, I'm thinking I'm at the point where I need to invest in a garden cart um, because carrying heavy loads, it's easy to um, be unstable and then you're always adjusting with your back. And uh, so that's poor ergonomics. You also have to lift a lot higher um, with wheelbarrow handles. And a cart like this, not only do you if you're loading in soil, um, you don't have to lift the shovel as high or mulch or something like that, um, but you also get to carry it lower. It takes a lot less effort to steer it, and uh, it's, um, I think, a, a really good idea for uh, those of us who are <laughs> having troubles with wheelbarrows and heavy loads. Pruning shears, they do sell some now that are for people with uh, smaller hands and you can even get rotating handles for your smaller hands um, and left-handed um, left pruners as well. Uh, I really like the ones that have the rotating handles. I wish when I had worked at the Bruce Company way back in the late 80s, um, these were kind of unaffordable at that time, but I remember the first few weeks working 10 hours a day doing pruning and I ended up with um, bursitis in my uh, elbow and you know I had to rotate off the pruning crew which was humiliating <laughs> um, for a week and a half or so while I recovered and uh, at that time you know I finally was like okay fine I'll bite the bullet and buy the expensive shears and it really did help. If you need long handled pruners, make sure you get the ones with the aluminum handles that don't weigh as much. Now you notice this woman is standing quite a far ways away from that hedge. Ideally, you'd want to be closer so that you're not having to uh, put your arms up like this, which puts pressure on your shoulders. And also it's, um, you know, the, the weight uh, of the pruners ends up on your uh, shoulders as well. So. You can get some that have telescoping handles so that you can adjust them so that it's right for whatever job you're doing. Now, whenever you are though standing close to something and things are falling on you, it's not a bad idea to have some safety goggles. Um, I certainly have made the mistake of um, not doing that when I was sawing and getting sawdust in my eyes. And you, know, you learn your lesson fairly quickly um, when you do that. Okay, um, almost out of time here, but um, I will take any questions that um, mm -hmm. fit in. I'm happy to stay later, and if people need to leave, um, that's fine as well. Okay, so we have our first question is about rotation. Someone wonders if they planted potatoes in the bed last year, what is a good plant in that bed this year? Well, anything that is not in the Solanaceae family. So not uh, tomatoes, not tomatillos, not uh, peppers, not eggplant. Um, there are some books that will say, oh, you should use you know, this family after that family. And yeah, there is some science to that, but I guess I wouldn't get particularly hung up on that. Um, you might want to use like something in the legume family, like uh, beans or, or peas or 
something like that. Uh, you could use um, something in the Chenopodiaceae like spinach or beets. Um, so any other family other than Solanaceae. Okay, and I have a couple questions about soil with raised bed gardens, how you um, maintain them yearly and what kind of soil amendments do you add to replenish it every year? Um, okay, so um, with the raised beds, I usually end up adding some of the potting mix again that is soilless as well as some either composted manure or topsoil or a mixture of the two. And again, in that two to one, um, two potting soil to one of the topsoil or and or compost. Um, you want to have it, you can kind of feel when it's right. You want to have it dense enough that um, the plants are getting, you know, good amounts of nutrients from the topsoil and or composted manure, um, but also that it's light enough to work. And usually, you know, you're going to lose a couple of inches out of your beds every year. So um, I just go through and add whatever I need. Now, if you find that your um, your setup is it, it's too heavy, you can add more of the potting soil. If it seems like it's not heavy enough, you add uh, one of the others. If it's really heavy, you might want to add something like rice hulls. Um, that can help lighten up um, as well. And someone said you mentioned disinfecting your bed. How do you do that and with what? Yeah, that's a nasty thing to have to do. <laughs> um, I, it, you know, sometimes people will, will call me and they've got some terrible um, soil disease and there's nothing for it other than, you know, getting rid of the soil that's in the bed. Uh, and then disinfecting the bed. Um, you can use like, you know, hydrogen peroxide probably would be the, that's what I usually recommend. Um, depending on what the organism is, Brian Huddleston might recommend uh, something else, um, but usually hydrogen peroxide will, will do the job. You don't wanna use something like, you know, Lysol or something like that that's gonna leave um, a residue. Okay, this is another rotating question. Someone asking if you can rotate your perennial herbs or can they be left in the same spot? Perennial herbs should be left in the same spot. Okay, and how do you keep critters like squirrels, chipmunks, raccoons, possums from digging in your containers and sprouting what you recently planted? <laughs> oh, yeah, critters. Gosh darn it. <laughs> um, that is a really uh, tough one. If it's squirrels, you can put um, larger decorative pebbles on the um, surface of your, your pots. Um, if, you're, if you're growing in containers and they're like digging out your petunias or digging out your, your lettuce, um, sometimes that will discourage them. Uh, also, you can use um, chicken grit. Unfortunately, that comes in huge bags. So unless you can find a you know, smaller bag, you probably don't want 50 pounds of it sitting around. But they don't seem to like digging in that too much. Um, so you can you know, put like an inch of that on top of the soil, see if that helps. There's always chicken wire. Um, I certainly, I, my bean beds every year, I end up having to fence those off. I put um, stakes in my raised beds all the way around and I just chicken wire those off. And yes, it does mean I have to reach over that in order to get in there. Um, so I try and get chicken wire that's not too high um, so that I can get in, but that the rabbits are discouraged. Oh, and somebody wants to know, what kind of fertilizer do you suggest for the raised beds? Boy, you know, um, I don't have a particular favorite. Um, if you want to use um, traditional products, um, you can certainly use, you know, the Miracle Grow or Scotts or any of those brands. I would make sure that it's not too high in nitrogen unless you're growing a foliage crop. 
Um, but if you're, you know, growing something like tomatoes, you don't want it to be too high in nitrogen. Um, you also don't want it to be too, I guess what I would call concentrated or hot. Um, I prefer for vegetables not to have any number of the N, P, and K higher than 10, um, just so that, you know, you, you don't end up with a lot of growth and, and not a lot of um, fruit. Um, if you want to use organic materials, that's fine. You can use um, compost tea. That, that's a, a good fertilizer. Um, uh, fish emulsion. Well, fish emulsion is mostly nitrogen. And if you have critters digging, definitely don't use fish emulsion because you'll have more critters attracted than by that fishy smell. I know some of those products, they've managed to take the smell out of it, but I don't, um, I don't know how easy those are to get. But compost tea would work. Um, and you can certainly use slow release too, if you like. I tend to do that just because I've got so much other stuff going on that I don't seem to remember very well to fertilize every two weeks with a uh, traditional type of water soluble fertilizer. So. If I know that I've got the materials in there for the season, then I'm good to go. Awesome. Someone wants to know how can drip irrigation be integrated into the square foot raised garden and how does the excess water drain out? Oh, good question. Um, now, if you go to our Dane County Extension Teaching Garden site, we've got a whole section in there on um, drip irrigation, and we do use that in our raised beds. Um, the raised beds are set on top of the soil, so it does drain out the bottom into, um, you know, the soil that is underneath the bed, and uh, so we don't have any drainage problems like that, and um, we do have to, you know, blow out the lines every year, and we do take in the, um, the drip irrigation hoses um, I remember one year my mom tried those and left them out in her um, in her rose bed. And in the spring, we could see squirrels were chewing on those and birds were pecking at them. And so they sprung leaks all over the place. It was a disaster. So um, definitely don't leave your um, drip hoses out over winter. Okay, then we have a viewer. I am using the Hugo Koo tour, I'm not sure how to say that, Heige, method in my raised garden beds. I had garden soil put on top of leaves and grass clipping layer. Should I add topsoil or peat moss or what? Okay, tell me again what the two bottom layers are. The, the leaves and grass clippings. Okay. And then garden soil. I think with hookah culture, you start with a base of branches. Yeah, that's what I water. thought. Yeah, um, so I, I'm not. Um, that's why I was asking you to repeat it because I was I was looking for the the woody material that are usually at the bottom. Uh, and, oh, the, she said she has logs and sticks at the very bottom. Oh, okay. All right. Good. All right. Um, yeah. So what's supposed to happen is over time, those things are supposed to decompose and you do end up having to add more um, soil on top eventually. Um, I'm not all that familiar with it. I, um, I have done a little bit of reading about it, but I don't feel like I am really an expert enough to be able to um, make a whole lot of recommendations for that. Okay, and someone's asking about the PowerPoint presentation and you said you were gonna send me the charts of it. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll send you um, it, it in a two slide per page format and in a six slide per page format if people wanna print it out or review it, um, either one of those two ways should work. So you should be able to find my email in your Zoom invite that you can get that for me. And Otherwise, also this uh, program is being recorded, right? And you can watch the whole thing in its entirety. And Jill, could you tell people how to access it? Yes, you can find it. We will announce it on our Facebook page, but YouTube, Kimberly Public Library has a YouTube channel, and we put these on there, and you will be able to access it. 
probably around the end of the week when I get it on and you'll be able to, since it'll be in its entirety, you can fast forward to where you need to go if, if you don't want to watch the whole thing or you just want to look again for that information that you might have missed or want to see it again. So that's another option for you. Okay, and then we have somebody asking about the Master Gardener program. I'd like to know when the Master Gardener program is open for a new cohort. I'm not sure about that. For no. For some new Master Gardener, it looks like. Somebody wants to take the class. Could you uh, send your question to gardener, S-O-S, at outagamey.org? And we can get you uh, some information on that. The other source would be to go to our website, ocmga.net, Master, Master Gardener Organization at outagamycounty.net. And we'll be able to get you started on uh, getting into the program. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. I see a lot of thank yous and someone saying they're back. Thanks us. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make one comment is about 30 years ago, I started trying uh, square foot gardening and it has revolutionized how I garden. You may not uh, go it by the book, <coughs> But take care of the, you know, learn the concept, get the original book, and uh, which you can get at the Kimberly Public Library, I bet. Probably. <laughs> and uh, definitely look into that. It is an amazing concept. Yeah, I've done it as well and had very good luck. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you all for coming. I am going to end this session, and we will see you later. Thank okay. you, Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.